pay attention to the rendering of graphics in the games presented before you, it is based on procedural objects, that is, polygonal meshes are not used for them, in general there are no familiar concepts of polygons as such, and all lighting, shadows, the objects themselves and the interactions between them are generated in real time using one of the ray casting techniques. And in this case, the sphere tracing algorithm is used, or in the more familiar name ray marching. In this video we will take a closer look at the process of creating procedural objects and as a result we will create a rather interesting demo scene shown on the screen, in general we will act as an architect of three-dimensional graphics without loading textures and without using polygons. And this scene is done in just one open GL fragment shader, so almost all work will be done in GLSL shader language. Here is a template for working with shaders using the modern GL module. This is the application class in which we initialize the OpenGL context, create a plane equal to the size of the selected resolution, then load the vertex and fragment shaders, pass the uniform variable about the resolution size to the shader and start the render using a separate method. In the vertex shader, everything remains by default, that is, the coordinates of the vertices of the display plane are transmitted for rasterization, and all the main work will be done in the fragment shader. So, to begin with, Using the value of the resolution variable, we normalize the coordinate system so that the center of the rendering screen coincides with its beginning, this will be the UV vector. The call variable will determine the color of the pixel, and we will calculate it in the render function. Let's run the program and make sure that the center is in the middle of the working window. And before moving on, I would like to say a few words about the sphere tracing technique or ray marching. Ray marching is based on signed distance functions, sometimes they are called distance fields or SDF for short, these functions, when transmitting the coordinates of a point in space, always return the shortest distance between this point and some surface, and the sign of this distance indicates whether the point is inside this surface or outside. As for the ray marching algorithm itself, it is more clear to consider a section of three-dimensional space. Let's say we have set the sphere in the center of the screen, then we can look at the movement of one ray. A ray is given by the characteristics of its position ray origin and ray direction. It is clearly seen that each step the ray makes is equal to the shortest distance to the sphere, our task is to emit rays from all the pixels of our screen and find the distance to the object, and this will be enough to get its projection on the screen. Let's return to the code and first of all we will form rays for each pixel, for this we will define the variable's origin of the ray and its direction, and to implement the operation of the ray marching algorithm, we will define values for the number of steps of the ray, its maximum distance and epsilon for the calculation accuracy when approaching the surface. The ray marching algorithm itself is a loop over the number of ray steps, where we form a ray p, and cast it to the distance obtained from the map function until we get closer to the surface of the object or go beyond the limits of the maximum distance. And in the map function, the entire scene will be completely built, and now we will place the sphere at the center of the origin, get the distance to it and return the value, taking into account the ID of the object, and we will use this ID in the future. And now you can display this sphere, return to the render function and get the value of the ray marching function, and if the distance has not gone beyond the maximum value, then in a simple way we calculate the color of the object. Let's run the program and so far the sphere is displayed as a circle, since there is no lighting model yet. But despite this, an interesting operator of infinite repetition of an object can be used in the map function, and in this case one can already observe the depth of the whole picture. And by the way, such an operator is very useful, it allows you to create an infinite number of primitives without increasing the amount of memory in your application. And then I will use a useful file with a large set of unique functions for the ray marching technique. This file can be downloaded from the Mercury Demoscene team website and is updated periodically. This is a kind of Klondike library for creating cool scenes in ray marching, by placing this file in a folder with shaders it is easy to connect it using the include directive, in which case you can use all the functionality from the included file and in the future it will be very useful to us. So let's put a plane under the sphere, for this we take the sdf function of the plane from our library file and assign a new id. Here it is worth noting that there are three basic operations with working on objects. The first is the object union operation, where we find the minimum of two functions. Second this is the operation of intersection of objects, here we calculate their maximum. And the third operation is the difference, we take the maximum with the opposite sign of one of the objects. And now we need to put the sphere and the plane together, so we will write a union function for them, taking into account the ID of these objects. So let's use this function for a plane and a sphere. 
As a result, we can observe two of these objects together, but again there is no lighting model, so let's move on to solving this issue. And for this we will write the get light function, at the input of which there will be a vector p with its direction and the color of the object. Then, based on the results of the ray march function, we compose the vector p and form the resulting color according to the value of the get light function. Create a lighting model based on the Lambert law, according to which the amount of reflected light is proportional to the scalar product of the vector directed to the light source and the normal vector to the surface. To calculate the normal we find the gradient to the surface, for this we take a point on the surface of the object and subtract a small number from it to get the second point, this is an approximate method and allows you to perform a cheap trick to find the gradient. By the way, you can visualize the resulting normals and make sure that they are calculated correctly. And now you can calculate the lighting according to the Lambert law, we find the scalar product of vectors and multiply by the color of the object. And as we see with such a simple lighting model, the image of the scene becomes much more interesting. To give color to each object, the ID assigned to them will come in handy for now. Let's write a get material function that will return the color depending on the value of the ID of the object. Then using this function you can get the color of the object and pass it to the get light function. And as expected, the objects became colored, but at the same time the whole picture looks quite faded. So now we need to perform gamma correction of the color, this is an important part of the rendering but at the same time easy to overlook. To implement shadows from objects, we need to compare two distances, the first is from point P to the nearest object, we get it using the ray march function, taking into account a small correction along the normal, and the second is to the light source. And obviously if the value of the distance D is less than this point is in the shadow. And the next improvement will be the procedural painting of our plane in a checkerboard texture. This trick is based on the remainder of dividing the sum of the selected components of the vector P by the number 2. Now we will create a background in the scene, we will introduce a background variable for this. And the background color will go into the result when we go beyond the maximum distance. So gradually the resulting image is getting better but now there is an unpleasant aliasing due to the checkerboard texture going into the distance. To smooth out such a drawback, the implementation of the fog effect will allow, we will do this in the form of interpolation of the color of the object to the background value according to an exponential dependence on the distance, in addition, a beautiful transition can be made along the background depending on the direction of the ray. Thus, we have a smooth transition in the horizon area and the sky itself looks more realistic. But at the same time, the lighting of the object and the color of the cast shadow began to look inappropriate. Lambertian lighting is more suitable for matte surfaces, but we will make a simple Fong lighting model, for this we need the inverse ray direction vector and the vector R reflected from the light source. If we raise the scalar product of these vectors to some power, we get the specular component, in addition, we define the variable for ambient light, and then the ambient value will go into the shadow, and the sum of all components will go into the main color. And as a result, such a model gives a more decent picture, in fact, there are a lot of lighting models and we have considered only the simplest ones. The next step will be the implementation of the camera, knowing the position of the camera and its orientation vector, we calculate the forward vector as their difference, and we calculate the right and up vectors using the cross product. Let's set the look at orientation vector and apply the resulting transition matrix to the camera space and also change its initial position. Well, in the end we can see the resulting image from a different angle. So we have a camera and therefore we can add an interactive element. In the main file, we will use the inherited method for mouse events and pass its current position to the shader. And in the shader it will be a vector2 uniform variable with the same name. And when we have data about the position of the mouse, we will write a function that allows us to rotate the initial position of ray origin around the x-axis and also around the y-axis. Then we apply this function, and at this stage we get the opportunity to look around the sphere, or rather around the look-at point, in other words, in which direction the camera is looking. And finally, we have come to the final stage, where you can use your creativity to the fullest. Let's go back to the map function and put a cuboid on the stage, let's just call it a box. We will make the calculation of the result a little more convenient and, due to the fact that the scale of the further scene will be larger, we will move the plane down. 
so we observe a black box, since we have not yet assigned the ID of this object. So we go to the getMaterial function and assign the appropriate color. And the same color will be used for future objects in our scene. And the next object that will be used is a cylinder, and as you can see, we are now actively using the most useful functions from the included library file. After creating the cylinder, we will use the function of combining it together with the box. The cylinder can be rotated using the swizzling operation, in other words, let's swap the components of the vector P. In order to manipulate the object, it is better to create a new vector and then define the vector PC for this. Let's move the cylinder higher and make the cylinder shorter, and as a result, our two objects formed a kind of plate, which we will use a little later. Next, we will use the box2 function, using this function we will create an endless wall and see how it looks separately. I think it has already become obvious that if we subtract the resulting figure from the box and the cylinder from this wall, we will get a passage in the form of an arch. And in this case, we will write a general function for the difference of objects, taking into account their ID. Well, then we use the function of the difference between the wall and the formed plate. And as a result of such an operation, we get a cutout in the wall in the form of an arch. And here I would like to note that the included file offers a set of functions that perform very beautiful transitions on the boundaries of objects when they are combined, difference or intersection. So in our case, these functions cannot be used directly, since they do not take into account object ID, but they are easy to use for our needs and writing new ones taking into account ID is not difficult. Now we replace the object difference function with an advanced one and get a rather interesting result, in general, we made a chamfer like in an old palace of the medieval era. For this project, in a similar way, I wrote two more functions, but only for the union operation. And use the first one to merge with the checkerboard plane. Such a union function brings a stepped and original transition between the wall and the plane. And now we can use the repeat operator along one of the axes, which in turn gives us infinite arcs that repeat through the specified distance. The next object in our scene will also be an endless box, but it will act as a roof for the future building. You need to place the roof approximately at the junction with the wall and you can use the second function to combine the objects. As you can see the whole scene now looks like some kind of endless bus stop. We use a function to rotate the vector P by some angle, and at the moment the whole scene looks like half of some building. In general, this was intended to use the modulo operator on the selected axis with some offset, and this modulo trick allows you to get an infinite corridor by a mirroring operation. And at the moment it's time to apply the most useful function that will mirror the space along two axes and also along the diagonals. And the result of the application of such a function was the formation of a whole building, it certainly looks more like a temple, but still quite impressive. In general, we will not dwell on this and we can continue to improve our final scene. And now I propose to do one more procedural texturing but only for the roof of the building. For a new ID, the following expression, based on the P vector, forms a procedural lattice, which we multiply by the selected color. And if you ask this question, you can find a number of other ways to generate such textures. As a small improvement, let's add a reflected light component according to Fresnel to the get light function. This contributes to the fact that objects may be illuminated slightly differently when viewed from a sharp angle. Now the Fresnel reflection is visible as an iridescent glare along the walls. In the center of our temple there is a great platform for placing some scene and let's place the sphere created at the beginning there. Since the scale of the scene has become larger, we will increase the radius of the sphere and apply the usual union function. After adding the sphere, you can create some animation and the time variable will help for this, then in the main file we will pass the time value to the shader. In the shader itself it will be a uniform variable with the same name, and when we have this parameter, we will write a displacement function. Here a creative approach is usually used, but as a rule it is based on the multiplication of trigonometric functions. And then use this displacement with to the radius of our sphere. 
And as you can see now, the sphere looks like a mysterious object. So despite the amount of work done, these are just basic things that are considered fairly simple. And offhand this scene can be finalized and improved for a long time, for example, implement anti-aliasing, triplanar texturing along with ambient occlusion and other advanced things. And perhaps this is the subject of conversation in the next videos on the channel, and if you are interested in learning more about these techniques, then be sure to write in the comments.